What's going on here? What's wrong with the picture? What? Why is it black and white for? All I want to do is sit down at the end of the day and have a peaceful game of Mario. Now I've got a black and white issue with this monitor. What's going on? Is your Sony PVM and BVM giving you troubles? No colour? Black and white picture? Well, this is the video for you. I will show you with a high probability of success how to diagnose the fault correctly without even taking the case off. Further, I'll show you how to disassemble, repair the fault, tune it in, reassemble, and then hopefully you should be good to go. The color loss problem is such a common fault that Sony issued at least two repair bulletins to rectify the problem. The two bulletins are in the description below. I will show you shortly a range of different monitors that the fault applies to. Listen to me carefully. This fault does not apply to RGB and component signals. It only applies to composite and S-video. If you have black and white problems with RGB or component, this fix is not for you. It only applies for composite and S-video. Further, in the service bulletins, there is a range of serial numbers to which the monitors are affected. If the serial number on your monitor is above the service bulletin numbers, then it's unlikely that you have this fault as well. In summary, if you have intermittent or permanent black and white issues in composite or S video on the affected models with the included serial numbers, then there's a very high probability, probably 80 or 90%, that you have the fault this, that this video will fix. Oh, by the way, this is the disclaimer. I take no responsibility if you get electrocuted or irradiated. This video is just for my purpose. I like to record myself, so don't follow any advice in case this happens to you. The old Mets started smoking, old son. Oh, shit! Fucking hell. I want to make it clear that despite there being two different engineering service bulletins, they both cover exactly the same fault and remedy the situation in exactly the same way. It's just that one service bulletin is specifically for this model here, the 9044D, the BVM 9044D, whereas the other bulletin covers a wider range and uses the United States versions of the model names and numbers. To give an idea on the monitors that are included in the guide, in the bulletins, these are all Australian versions. As I said, the 9044D, the 6041 QM, the American equivalent is the 5041 Q, the 9044QM, the US version is the 8044Q. This here is the 9040ME, the US version is the 8040. One other monitor that is not shown is the lower line count version of this, the 9041QM, also known in America as the 8041Q. There is another monitor. Also, that's part of this range. That this one is the Sony Dash PVM 8043MD, a medical version. You can see by the cream white color on the casing that this is suitable for hospital environments. This monitor is also subject to faulty trimmer capacitors causing black and white images. The fix is not for any monitors above nine inches in size. This excludes 13s and 14s and 20s and so on and so on. This is the part causing our woes. Trimmer capacitors. These are ones I've pulled out of monitors in the past to do repairs. 
they're very easily distinguished. If you open up your monitor and find these orange ones, orange plastic ones with big metal tops, that's your problem. They should be replaced. They're destined to fail. Get rid of them. Put some good trimmer capacitors instead. There are a maximum of two inside the monitor. One for PAL signals and the other for NTSC signals. They are both located together on the B boards inside the monitors. There is an exception, the Sony PVM 9040ME, American equivalent 8040, only contains one trimmer capacitor. The PAL model only accepts PAL signals, therefore it only needs one trimmer capacitor. The parts required to fix the fault include ceramic capacitors at a value of 5 picofarads and 50 volts. These are fairly commonly available. These are some cheap ones off eBay, but quite adequate for the job. Here's another one from RS Online, made in the Czech Republic. These are higher end. Same job. If you want to be a bit more fancy, you can go for an RS Online or Mouser or any of those guys and get a higher end sort. The trickier part, if I can say such a thing, are the adjustable trimmer capacitors. What I use are these ones from RS Online. There's a tub full of them there. The part number, which is in the description below, is, well, RS Online stock number is 1753544. The value is between, it's adjustable, but it's between 3 and 10 picofarads at 100 volts. Sony calls for a 10 picofarad value trimmer capacitor. I haven't taken one out that they use as a replacement and measured its full range. I've had no trouble with these trimmer capacitors. Their maximum value is 10, and that's what's recommended. That's perhaps not ideal. There is another style from RS that's between 4.5 and 20 picofarads, so the 10 would fit nicely into that. But to avoid confusion, you can go with these ones. As I've said, it's listed in the description. They come in a minimum of 25, probably cost you around 17 bucks, who knows with inflation these days. These are the correct size, they'll fit into the PCB, no worries. You can use a screwdriver to tune it in. They're adjustable. The difference between, say, a volume knob on the front of the monitor, the volume knobs are designed for thousands of turns, whereas trimmer adjustable electronic components are typically only designed for maybe a couple hundred turns. They're like a one night stand. You screw it once and that's it, never again. With a trimmer capacitor, it gets set in the factory, one and done, that's it. One night stand, never adjust again. Here we go, my friends. Here are the troublemakers in the wild. Right there, one and two, both orange plastic on the bottom, the old school faulty style ones. At some stage in production, Sony realised that the orange trimmer capacitors were faulty. They employed the fix that we see in the service bulletins, and they also applied this fix in the factory to monitors with serial numbers above the ones featured in the service bulletin. If you open up your monitor and locate the trimmer capacitors and see that they are both blue, then you've already had the fix applied and you shouldn't need to replace those at all. The blue is a giveaway. The blue trimmers are a different style altogether than the orange ones. Also on the back is a telltale sign. The ceramic capacitors are soldered in, there and there, and held down 
with some adhesive of some sort. This is not totally uncommon for manufacturers to fix problems like this. It's a bodge job, but it's probably easier than re-kitting their construction lines or redesigning the PCB to accommodate the new parts. Rather, they just solder them on direct and secure them that way. You can also see it, something else Sony's done here too. There's a couple of resistors added. So it's not necessarily from an end user doing their repair themselves. It can come from factory like this. I'll repeat it once again. If you have the blue trimmers as such, you shouldn't be having any black and white troubles in composite or S video. At least not from the trimmers. I don't want to add any confusion, but this is a freak example of a monitor. This couldn't have come out of the factory like this. I don't think Sony would have done this. If we look carefully, we see on the left one of the old orange-based faulty trimmer capacitors. Then on the right, we see one of the newer style trimmer capacitors. It's in green, however, which may indicate it's a different value of capacitance. There's no way Sony would have mixed up these two like that. And to support that case is that on the bottom side, there's no ceramic capacitors to support that trimmer. I think someone's come along and fixed that right side to get the PAL signal right. I am in Australia, we do use PAL here. They didn't bother putting the cap on the bottom, but it still works. It's still tuned in and it works, and it works for as long as I used it today. In any case, it was strange to see such an odd mix together, and I felt that I needed to film it. To disassemble the monitor, firstly, make sure the power is off and there's no power connected to the monitor. We'll take these four screws off on this side first. Actually, the four screws on the other side are already removed. Right, that cover's ready to come off. Lift it up from the back, just pull it out like that, easy. There's a point I want to emphasize strongly here. That is that these plastics that the PCBs are in are or can be mega, mega brittle. Particularly if the monitor's been in an environment with a lot of heat, these become ultra brittle and will break so easily. These ones here aren't too bad. But some of them, you can just push it around a bit like this and it'll snap. Easy. My tip is don't use, don't use the electric screwdriver because it's got too much torque and it can put a lot of pressure on the plastic initially. Normally we take the two screws out here on the sides, which we will do, but to get around the brittleness of the plastic, take out the screws on the top here on this cross beam member. That helps the monitor stay rigid. Take the screws out on each end. This will give you some slack. It'll give you just a little bit of slack to make things easier to make this side pivot out. Sony designed this plastic system for ease of use. Not a bad idea, but what we normally do is hold the clips in and then pivot this side downwards, but I don't like to squeeze the plastics for obviously, for the obvious reasons I've just stated. So I like to separate it like that and that just comes out. As such, pull that ground cable out, pull that tally light cable out, pull that neck board cable out, and there you go. You've got access to the top side of the board now. If we wanted to, we could operate the monitor with the PCB down. It's not necessary, strictly speaking, to have that ground cable in, nor the tally light cable. But to get the neckboard cable to reach, there's a little cable clip at the top here on the cross member bar. We can take it out of the clip and then plug it in as such. And that would enable the red, green and blue to go up to the neckboard. If we don't have that cable plugged in, we won't get any picture at all. But we don't need that in at the moment. 
Fortunately, we don't need to take the PCB out of this plastic holder to change over those trimmers. Normally the three clips here, one, two, and three would be squeezed so that it would release the board. But again, with the brittleness of this plastic, if you can not need to take the PCB out, don't do it. Fortunately, we can do the soldering in this job. The plastic frame on the underside is not in the way of the trimmers. I'm ready to desolder out the old trimmers. I've got the monitor on the bench on its side. Here you can see the B board pivoting. This gives you an idea on the orientation. Zooming into the spot, zooming into the solder side of the trimmers. What I like to do to desolder parts is generally trim off a bit of the, the legs. Don't go flush down to the solder joint, otherwise you rip the pad up itself. Put on a bit of solder there and there a bit of fresh solder here's the trimmer down here I've got to get the aim right so i'll put some solder on here as well and there that's good we can even put some even put some flux on for good measure like that Now I'll put my finger on the underside of that trimmer and then I'll just heat up this joint Get it like so Loosening the joint up. Get my thumbnail into the other side of it. It's nearly out, one leg's out. Just work a little bit more on the other side. We're close. That's it, it's out. There's our bad trimmer. And what I'll do then is I'll put a bit more solder on where I've just removed that component, blob it up, get the solder joints nice and plump. And I'll desolder those too. <coughs> that worked well. Then I'll clean the two holes with a bit of ISO, isopropyl alcohol. Should be. Yep, good. The holes are both empty, ready for the good trimmer to be put in. Now I'll desolder the other, the other trimmer. Let's get the desoldering gun there. There's one side out. Trying to get my finger behind the other trimmer. That's got it. Pretty sure that's out. Just dropped out. There's our little green fellow. The unusual one. Now I'll plump these solder joints up. Plump them back up and suck them dry. Beautiful. Give those a clean. And we're ready to put the replacement trimmers in. Here are the two trimmers. They're both of the exact same value. It doesn't matter which way they go. You can't muck that up. I'll put one in the vacant hole, the vacant spot. 
You may need to bend the legs in a little bit. Alright, so one's in. You can see that sitting there. Now I've got to flip the board back over using my middle finger to hold that trimmer in place. I solder it back in. There's one leg done. Give the tip a clean. Heat this joint up. I could have used a bit of flux, but that's all right. It got a little bit messy, but we can fix that up. Should be fine. In fact, what I'll do is I'll put a little bit more solder on. Now that my hands are both free, I'm holding the actual trimmer. We'll put the other trimmer in. Get in there, that's it. Hold that with the finger. I'll solder this trimmer in. Beautiful. Put a little bit more of the solder on, plump them up a bit. Good, the trimmers are in. Now I'm gonna put in two ceramic capacitors. I like to cut, cut the legs down. Now the instructions say for them to be soldered on in parallel. What that means is that it's soldered directly across the trimmers that we've just put on. I'm going to angle it up a little bit so it doesn't touch any other components. I'm just going to heat that joint up like so. I'm going to heat that joint up and press the leg on. That's it, that's done. It's soldered across, soldered in parallel, leg for leg from the ceramic capacitor to the trimmer capacitor and I'm going to do the same on the other side here. Heat the solder joint up. Heat the solder joint up on the other one. And I might even top them up a little bit. Make them a little bit stronger and, and that one's nearly touching another solder joint. The last step I like to apply is to secure these caps. They're probably right as they are somewhat floating in the air. They're secured, they're soldered in, but I like to put in some hot glue. Now, just a little blob like that's more than enough. Push the cap in. A little pumpkin seeds. And then I'll lift that up. Just put a little glob in and then push that down. That's all it needs. It is arguable that hot glue is probably not the best option. If any one of you have experience using hot glue, if you get a blob of that hot stuff on your finger, it will burn. Therefore, it is quite hot and it will apply some temperature to the components that I've just put it onto, but whether it actually is enough to cause any problems, I don't know, but I've never had any trouble with hot glue in this job you're probably better to use silicon adhesive instead. Now that that's done, we can tune in these trimmers. And to do that, we need to get some test patterns up. The extract on screen is from the service manual for the PBM 6041QM. As I said before, the monitors all share a very similar architecture. However, it is best for you to get the specific manual for the monitor that you have. According to the service manual, in order to tune in the trimmer capacitors, you need a power supply that can supply 12 volts and 5 volts. You also need a frequency counter. Some oscilloscopes include a frequency counter built into them. 
If you don't have any of that gear, don't worry, you can do it completely by eye and I'm gonna show you how. You might even find that when you turn the monitor on with the newly installed capacitors, the color will be already set and good for use. You might get lucky when you turn your monitor on and find that it's already in color and looking good. Word of caution, the adjustments made here can only be done when the power is on. You don't need to go poking anywhere else inside the monitor. You only need to adjust the two trimmers. At the most, I'm using a ceramic flathead screwdriver. A plastic one will do. Best not to use metal. It can cause interference while you insert it into the trimmer and make adjustments. My hot tip, if you have a generator, a pattern generator that can output CCAM, that's what we're in now via composite video. It won't matter if it's S video or composite for this adjustment. If you have a CCAM signal output and you can generate a green screen only, this one seems to be the most sensitive to being untuned or detuned. Now it's fine at the moment. If I adjust the trimmer on the right, which affects PAL signals and CCAM, you'll note now that the screen's gone gray. There's also some interference flickering in there. If you get this screen right, in my experience again, let me adjust it. Here we go. Nice, bright, green, consistent all over. If you get that one right, all your PAL signals should be good too. There's PAL N, which is not supported by the monitor and PAL M's not supported. There's regular PAL, we'll go into the color bars, looking good. PAL 60's fine. The camera sees that flickering because the refresh rate's a bit higher on PAL 60, of course. And our NTSC signals are looking good as well. The trimmer on the left, from where I'm positioned in front of the monitor, controls the NTSC signals, but they look good. In fact, at worst, all I can do is make it a little duller by rotating the trimmer. That's good, I'm happy with that. The operation is complete, the repair is complete. All that's left now is to reassemble the monitor. Make sure the power is off on the monitor. Lift up the B board, place the ground cable back here into the center. Put the tally lamp cable back onto the left side here. Just be careful, don't force this panel back in. Sometimes the cables at the bottom can snag. You don't wanna push it hard because then you'll just bust the hinges off here at the bottom and you'll have more broken plastics. Put it in and we can feed the neck board cable into its clip. Twist that over to lock it in. Time to put the four black screws. These screws are all the same size. There are some longer black screws inside the monitor elsewhere, but. The four that we've taken out are all the same size. They are the shorter ones. Be careful not to drop a screw inside the monitor. Otherwise you may need to tip the monitor upside down and give it a bit of a shake to get the screw out. There we go. There's the internal screws back together. Now we need to put the cover on. Put your case on. Feed the lip of the case into the top of the bezel there like such, slip it down, and then we'll screw these screws in. Don't seem to have, just make sure that this is in flush, this left hand side here, despite me screwing in down the other end. And you do the same on the other side obviously as well, four on each. This one's got a base that's fallen out somewhat. There's a metal panel that sits underneath. That's a bit loose on this one, so I'm holding it up with my hand, left hand. That's good. I hope you've enjoyed the video. No doubt I'll do some more repair videos in the future. I'm right now, I can go and play Mario in colour. Although I imagine many of our viewers 
would not be dealing with composite or S video and go straight to RGB or component, of course. Still, we like to have our electronics, our monitors, our consoles working at 100% or as good as possible. Please share, like and subscribe. See you in the next video. On a side note, you may be interested to know about what Sony did with the next generation of monitors. They still used a very, very similar architecture to the previous generation, which is featured in this video. They did, however, change the circuit that's in question that's problematic going closer in. Instead of through-hole trimmer capacitors, Sony opted for surface mount trimmer resistors, both in a very similar position. There's one and there's two. I don't think they had any troubles thereafter once they made this change. Oh, you're still here. How did you go with your monitor? Did you fix the problem? Let me know in the comments below. Bye-bye.